Let's bring in uh, Jane Mulcurran, who is the uh, associate editor of the Times magazine. She's got a particular um, focus on the next generation of people and how they're uh, in absorbing all of this moment. Lovely to see you. And as always, good to have Michael Cole here as well, the uh, former BBC royal uh, correspondent and uh, a man who has got plenty of insights into this moment in time. Jane, um, how are the next generation, the people are probably a little more associated with the, the Will and Kate, or Will and Catherine as she must be referred to now, uh, version of things? Yeah, absolutely. Morning. Morning. Um, it's really interesting. There was a poll that came out yesterday um, about Charles's approval rating and whether people thought he was going to be a good king. Uh, and it was pretty high. I mean, it was about 65% in general across mm. the population that thought he was going to be a good king. But as you go down the population, you know, you crunch those demographics and it's different. Um, amongst the 18 to 24-year-olds, it's less than half. Really? Um, so, yeah, it's about 46% think he will be a good king. But interestingly enough, they have a very different perspective on how they expect him to be king. Um, they're very happy with him uh, expressing his opinions about the environment and architecture. So it's about 70% of them think that it would be fine for him to continue to be quite outspoken on the environment, uh, you know, on the climate issues. And that drops to about 35% amongst the over 65. So he does have a lower approval rating, but there's a greater belief in his ability to possibly connect on certain issues with younger people. So all is not lost. No, but see, but Michael, this, this opens the interesting issue here. The steel in the spine, the future of the firm is going to be William. It's going to be William stepping up and being more opinionated, taking on those things, because when he, of course, ascends to the throne, quite logically, if you know, 20, 30 years, he's got a pretty good healthcare system back here. Um, <laughs> then he's going to be with a bulk of people that are going to be a lot closer to what Jane was talking about. Yes, and now it's already being discussed that uh, the new Prince and Princess of Wales and their children may well be coming to Australia next summer, 2023, during the children's summer holidays here. They were, I think, with you in 2014, and this will be a very historic event. And could I just say, on behalf of the people of this country, the ordinary people, how delighted we are that 10 great Australians, they're not ordinary Australians, great Australians will be coming and be there at the funeral because Her Majesty the Queen did love Australia. She didn't just love it on Melbourne Cup days. She loved it uh, throughout her whole life and visited many times, and I was with her on some of those visits. But you know, Paul, today we're going to see something very special. Uh, there have only been seven in the last 200 years, seven funerals of monarchs. And this is the seventh one. Now, during that 200 years, we've seen more solar eclipses. So that's how special, how historic it's going to be. And we're going to see in a couple of hours time the gun carriage pulled by the King's Troop of the Royal Horse Artillery in their shakos with their brilliant horses. Seven horses led by an 18-year-old horse called Cassius. This is his swan song. After this, he'll be retired. Uh, and they will be taking a coffin made of English oak, lead-lined, a short walk at walking pace. Very difficult for horses to walk at a very slow pace, but they've all been in training. And behind uh, the coffin will be the new king, Charles III, his three siblings, his two brothers, uh, and his sister, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal. And behind them will be the Queen's cousin, the Duke of Gloucester, the Queen's nephew, Lord Snowden, and the Queen's son-in-law, Admiral Sir Timothy Lawrence. And then behind them, will be the two brothers, the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Sussex, known to us better perhaps as William and Harry, walking together. And uh, that is a very important show of the fraternal bond that exists. And as you know, family funerals, and this is a family funeral as well as a state occasion, can be the catalyst for reconciliation, mending fences, and my goodness, there are a few broken fences that need mending. This is why we love having you on, Michael. All the detail, all the insight, I love it, and Jane as well. We've seen, again, the early days of how Charles will run things, the management style. Mm. Um, 
pretty weird that the people who had been with him for a while have all just got the chop oh, yes. and all the people that were with mum at this stage seem they're going to stay around. Mm. What do you want to say uh, about the inns or what does that say about his yeah. management style? Um, well, I, I think he faces a bit of a challenge in terms of his management style. I think he... In a way, he's sort of caught between two eras and two kind of styles. You know, the Queen, um, she's all my generation have ever known. And she's a bit like our grandparents. You know, we can excuse her being perhaps seen as aloof sometimes, very guarded, stiff upper lip, you know, wartime generation. Didn't show her emotions. Um, certainly there was an enigma to her. And then we have Wills and Kate, on the other hand, who are almost Obama-like in their style, you know, touchy-feely, lots of hugs, emotions, very open heart on sleeve. Charles is kind of caught in the middle, as I think, you know, he's exactly the same age as my parents. I, I would say I think my dad is probably a lot more modern than Charles as a father, <laughs> but... Um, Does he use a fountain pen? <laughs> well, a lot better than Charles. Doesn't get quite as frustrated by the ink, either. Oh, look, any, look, anyone oh, who can use a fountain pen, I am well done. I think it's up there with being able to reverse part. <laughs> We've well all had played, a fight, yeah. Great natural uh, talent. We've I all had a fight with a pen, just not had it filmed, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, but I do think he's in a, in a sort of difficult position because he's neither that youthful style and he's also not the kind of very guarded... Um, very enigmatic. He needs to find his own management style, and he needs to find how to relate to people. But also, this is this is this is the you know, the classic tension of mm. Gen X, and I know he's not Gen X, but still, which is you want to be differential yeah. to your parents and to your grandparents. The World War Two generation is the greatest generation yeah. um, of the modern era. They built a joint that is worth celebrating, it, but then you have elements of. You know, the internet that wants to turn around and pretend, oh, yeah, get rid of it all. We're the first people that would ever mm. walk to the earth. Mm. Um, there, there has to be a, a, a tension, and I hope that there's not a, a rush to want to yeah. dump the stuff because, you know, the polls say this, that or the other. I, I agree, and I think, you know, there is an enormous pressure on Charles because I think everyone knows that William and Kay are the rock stars of the royal family. And in a way, he just has to be a steady hand on the tiller for... 20 perhaps years, certainly 10, 15 years. And that's a tremendous pressure. I mean, he's not going to change the royal family. He just has to essentially keep it safe. So, Michael, again, those little moments and interactions, the staff stuff, I don't want to talk about the staff thing all night, but also the scenario of where, uh, when there was the little moment uh, in, uh, in Northern Ireland yesterday where he gets a little bit cranky and then the missus steps in and goes, settle down, pal. You know, a, camera, B, settle down, doll. Uh, seemed to be a very normal interaction. Again, what Jane's talking about, this, these generational tensions, how do you think that uh, the joint behind us is going to be able to, to handle that? Well, Paul here, if, if you come to me for just a second, I do have a, a fountain pen, my fountain pen in my hand, so I, I'm ready to loan it to, to, to the new king, and I'm quite, <laughs> I assure you, it will work properly. It will so beautifully. So we have to, of course, the, the, when he was Prince of Wales, occasionally he was a little bit irascible, and we saw something of that now. But in recent years, he was... Married 17 years ago, 2000, uh, 2005, on the coldest day I ever remember in, in Windsor. And he's very much more grounded. He's happier. He's more assured of himself. Um, he's a, an interesting man. I, I'm five years older than he is. Uh, and so I've, I've known him his whole life. And, I, and I've observed and I remember speaking to him when he was at Cambridge University. And I think he's matured into the role. And Paul um, and your excellent other guest talking about the length of the reign, um, it doesn't, I mean, of course, he's not going to reign as long as his mother, 70 years, but a short reign doesn't necessarily mean a, a bad reign. In fact, it can be an extremely good reign. Edward VII, um, the big fat king with the beard and the cigars and the potatoes, who succeeded his mother, Queen Victoria, in 1901, he only reigned until May 2010, just nine years, but he gave his name to the Edwardian era, which was regarded in, in our country and in your country, the Edwardian era, as a golden age. The, the king had a derby winner. He, he went to France. He kissed the hand of, a, of a, 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 an actress, a French actress, and said, Madame, you are as beautiful as France itself. And that, uh, that cemented the Entente Cordiale our, our liaison with France after very many difficult years between the two countries. 
And so he, he, he was an excellent king and he was much loved. And when, unfortunately, the terrible First World War broke out, which aff afflicted so many of your soldiers, Anzacs and ours, uh, those Tommies and Anzacs in the trenches said, this wouldn't have happened if King Teddy had been alive because uh, the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany was his, uh, was his nephew. And it, the thought was that he could make things that he, he would never have allowed war to have happened because he was related to all the crowned heads of Europe, most of whom disappeared after that war. So uh, people can change, Paul. You know, they can get better. There is a power of goodness. And I think uh, if you believe in that, if you believe in the power of virtue, and I think that woman whose face we're seeing there in the sketch, she embodied uh, goodness. And I think wherever she went, um, people appreciated that because, you know, Her Majesty the Queen um, wasn't grand. The, the job was grand. She was, in fact, quite modest. I mean, among her, among her close friends, and she had some, she didn't think she was marvellous, and she always had her mother and her sister to bring her down a peg if they thought she was getting too haughty. And um, she, you know, <laughs> what, is the what is the essence of good manners, Paul? I'll tell you what it is. It's making other people feel at ease and never making them feel uncomfortable. And Her Majesty the Queen did that in spades throughout her life. And uh, that's one of the reasons why thousands of people are coming. Where you are, why are those people there? They're not being bussed in. They're not being told to come. They're not giving bags uh, and told to wave them out. It's not uh, North Korea. And it's not, it's not a parade for Mr. Putin in Red Square. Yeah, very true, very true. Michael and Jane, could talk to you all night. Thank you very much. Thank I really you. appreciate your insights. We'll talk again in the coming days.